I know it's not show number 100, which is going to be a big celebration. So maybe Kevin and Steve didn't just feel it that important to be here. But I'm glad that Tony Gerdman's here to talk Ohio State football with us this week on edition number 96 of Buckeyes Live. But uh, we believe Steve's on his way. Tony, how's it going today? Things are going well. This is actually how I prefer the show, just me and you, to be honest. <laughs> that way we can just talk. Talk about whatever people want us to talk about, and we're not constantly being interrupted by Kevin and Steve. They tend to interrupt, don't they? They kind of get in the way. All right. This should be a nice, clean, like well-informed, entertaining show, folks. So this mm -hmm. is going to be a treat for all of you. Tony's predicting. All right. Here we go. Uh, what's not good concerning Ohio State football is this uh, shutdown for a week. But, of course, they have yet to hit spring practice uh, before we dive into that want to let everyone know that of course you're in the live chat so bring those comments those questions those debate topics and uh, i will pass them on to tony and uh, probably have something to say myself but uh, it was announced uh, two days ago that athletic operations would be shut down uh, what does that exactly mean we're in the middle of men's and women's basketball season of course so how far encompassing is that it's just a football thing. So that's that's really the only thing it encompasses, the whack. And I guess people who use the, the Woody Hayes Athletic Center uh, would have to use one of the 400 other campus buildings to practice in and work out in. So that is a, it's just mainly a, a football thing right now. And all that's going on right now is winter workouts as they get ready for spring practice, which – is scheduled to start March 19th and is still scheduled to mar start March 19th, even with this uh, pause, as they call it. So, yeah, impacts the football team. But, you know, sure, the coaches would rather be in the buildings and working and the players were working, but the players miss a week of spring every year for spring break, and uh, there is no spring break this year. So this is, I guess, this would be their, their spring break is getting this pause. And so – while it takes away from some of the work they would have been doing, it doesn't really it, – it's not really that much different than uh, any other year where they, they pause for a week after the first week of spring practice, and then um, they let them go to spring break, and then they come back to resume spring practice. And so this year there's going to be – there's should be no pause during spring spring practice. It's just this year the uh, – there was a pause that needed to happen before spring practice. And so they'll get back in uh, what, around Monday or so and then still have a few days to ramp up with, um, you know, reacclimating and, and making sure everybody's where they need to be before they start spring practice on Friday. So I, well, anytime there's a pause or a COVID, you know, once COVID gets mentioned, then it's like, oh, no, not here we go again. And there's plenty of that on Twitter, plenty of that on our, our on our message board. And while it's not ideal to still be dealing with this and having enough of uh, having enough positives to where you have to, you know, get everybody out, they did something very similar before fall camp last year, where they paused things, let everybody get out, you know, did some cleaning, and then everybody got back in to fall camp, and you just went. And so this feels a little bit like that, but again, I'll just reiterate: players have a week off every spring. You know, they they miss a, a portion a week of spring every year for spring break, and so, you know, maybe this is n not much different than that. Hey there, Steve. How are we doing today? I'm doing good. Sorry for my tardiness. Um, just had some life issues going on here, and uh, that's how it is sometimes. Life issues. Oh boy. So hope everything's going okay. But uh, yeah, we have to deal with. Uh, all that other stuff. It's not all about football, is it? No, it's not, unfortunately. And unfortunately, that's, that's this coming week, up though, another week or two. Yeah. I know you guys were talking about the. Yes, the unfortunately, COVID this week is about shutting down football. So yeah, we're still we're still stuck in 2020 talking about shutting down football. We don't we don't want any part of that. It's the year that won't end, I guess. 2020. All right. Don't know if you have anything to add on that, Steve. Tony just basically letting us know, hey, that that it's not an urgent situation with the timing. You know, we're not going to get to the end of the school year or miss anything if um, that they, they take that mid spring session week off anyway. Shouldn't affect the spring game at this point unless there's further 
delays that would push back the spring game or truncate the spring sessions itself. Yeah, I I just think that um, just the obvious that it's potential that maybe a handful of people would not be available for the first few days of spring practice until they get uh, whatever the X number of days is that they're allowed to participate again. I, I would look at it as a, a thing that's going to cost people uh, their entire spring practice or anything like that. So, um, you know, as long as the majority of the guys are healthy and able to get out there and work on fundamentals, work on scheme, work on getting better, work on improving, work on development, all those things that, that, that you need to have happen every spring, then uh, that's it. We don't have a list of guys who are impacted or anything like that. We may never even see a list of guys who are impacted if they keep us at arm's length and we're not even allowed to go. So, you know, um, you, you know, our, our joke when these things would come up would always be as long as it's not Justin Fields. So uh, that's no longer a concern, I guess. But um, at any rate, as long as it's not Justin Fields. You know, the good thing, and not to downplay, I guess I am downplaying COVID, but like if you do lose a quarterback, you've got two others who are on equal standing pretty much because nobody has thrown a pass this year, you know, in their careers. So everybody's kind of on the same uh, same footing there. Yep. All these comments are bringing to recollection a conversation I had with my daughter last night who's um, in PR – uh, at the University of Rhode Island, ready to graduate here in a couple months. Um, so she was given some kind of sports information. She's taking a sports information media class, and she has to uh, conduct an interview. She has to be interviewed and also conduct an interview. And she chose the hypothetical uh, play acting interview with Ryan Day. So we were going through her line of questioning, and right out of the gate, she hit hard with the quarterback issue and uh, the quarterback battle. So... She's hitting you, um, Coach Day up. Well, she's going to be, you know, talking to Ryan Day, going to hit him up hard about the quarterback battle right out of the gate. Were you yeah. playing the part of Ryan Day on that? Well, I will not be. It will be a classmate of hers. Does and that classmate know not to answer? Like, uh, don't give any definitive answers and uh, just talk around the issue and uh, maybe say, you know, that's a great question, but, you know, it's – you know, the, they'll all get reps. Well, you know, everybody's everybody's got an opportunity. Kyle McCord, he can win it. He's freshman, yeah, but, you know, they're all three really, really good, and uh, we'll get a look at them. And, uh, and then uh, just tell her, don't let her brains explode inside of her head. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be quite that savvy. So I, I don't know what's uh, – she's going to have to play the role of a Red Sox player on the other side, so – Vinay, thank you so much for the Super Chat contribution. Appreciate you showing up as you always do each and every week, along with a number of other Buckeye fans, of course. Vinay, thoughts on our chances of getting, this is uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, running back Nick Singleton, direct messaged him yesterday, and he confirmed the Ohio State is among his top two favorites. So, so basically, Vinay goes right to the source, gets some information, then asks us, I guess, to confirm it. And by the way, uh, I just recorded um, an interview with uh, Nick Singleton yesterday or the day before, so I'm going to release that here in the next couple of days. Awesome. Um, I think it looks good for Ohio State. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a great school for a running back, but uh, he's got some other outstanding schools on his list. If he says top two, that's great because – that means uh, Penn State, Wisconsin, Notre Dame in particular are all right there neck and neck with Ohio State. So if the Buckeyes have vaulted into his top two, that's pretty good. And uh, he would be a great one. Another outstanding running back from the Big Ten footprint, and particularly from the state of Pennsylvania. Anytime you can, can get a player you know, from one of those neighboring states where a rival school like Penn State uh, should be holding serve, uh, that's huge in so many ways. So um, I, you know, I, I don't worry so much about one particular recruit. Uh, I mean, they've got Travion Henderson and uh, Evan Pryor, I think, in this last class uh, for 21 that are probably two of the better running backs they've uh, gotten commitments from in really probably back to Zeke. So, or perhaps Dobbins, I guess, to be more precise. So, 
uh, and maybe even better than Dobbins, at least in Henderson's case. So, uh, you know, I'm not worried too much about it. Uh, this offense it kind of recruits itself, as we kind of talk about every week, that uh, they put up such prolific numbers running the football and throwing the football that kids are, you know, banging on the stadium gates to get in there and play for the Buckeyes. So if they don't happen to land Nick Singleton, I'm sure the next running back on their list will certainly take a long and hard look at Ohio State. So, again, I don't get wrapped around the axle, at least on offense, about one guy. I do believe they need to upgrade the talent level on defense and continue with that. And they have Jack Sawyer as an example and, you know, some of the DBs they're, they're starting to bring in a different, different guys. But uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I feel that, you know, if they're in the top two, that's a great place to be, obviously. And, and talking to people, I, I think he's maybe the most likely running back at this point, or maybe Damari Austin out of Texas. But I also think it depends on what happens this year with, you know, it does, if Travion Henderson comes out and rushes for seven or eight hundred yards and, and looks like the future, does that then make Singleton or the other running backs twice? Does that make does that send Nick Singleton to Penn State instead, or does it or does it make him think, wow, you know, you could play as a freshman there even with a bunch of veterans on the team and the best players play? So it just really depends on mindset of the individual players. And that's why Ohio state was able to get Travion Henderson and Evan prior together is because they didn't necessarily have this need to be the man. I need 25 carries. They wanted to play together because they understand that you, you know, it's, it's okay to have somebody right next to you and, you know, to, to share carries with and to play with. And so, um, but yeah, I think it, it, like he seems, I've just always been putting him like in the class Maybe Penn State steals them or Notre Dame. Or I mean, Wisconsin's not a bad place for a running back to go. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that, but uh, you know they, they tend to produce some guys, and they will uh, they will like if you want twenty five carries a game. I think there's almost there's like two places to go nationally. That is Wisconsin and then Alabama. But if you go to Alabama, you better be really really good to get those carries because they're going to have other guys there. Uh, but uh, you know it's. I think he's uh, got a pretty good chance to be a Buckeye. I know they really like him. He might. I think he might be their number one. You definitely don't have to go too far down the list to catch up with his rankings here. 247 Sports really loves him, even more so than the composite. 42nd overall, number three running back in the nation, number two in Pennsylvania. Not the number two running back, but the number two player in PA out of Reading, Pennsylvania. So Nick Singleton um, trimmed it down to nine officially. Uh, he told me on his Twitter recently he was down to nine, but um, Ohio State would seem to be near the top of that list. Talking Ohio State football, of course, here with uh, Steve Hellwagon from 247 Sports. Buck Nuts, Tony Gerdeman right there in the middle from Buckeye Scoop. Steve, uh, there was a hypothetical thrown out um, – on cleveland.com today about whether uh what what the ohio state football scene would look like had ryan day not been hired uh, and i was asking tony before we started to record who else was in that mix at the time uh as you recall being discussed uh, but it, but it was such a transition that happened so quickly it wasn't like the typical coach gets fired we're hanging out for two or three weeks and there's all this speculation. It was of course a transition from coach to coach. So a little bit different of a deal this last time between uh, transitioning from urban Meyer to Ryan day. We don't have you, Steve. Sorry. I had uh, turned off uh, because of background noise. Um, I don't recall much discussion of anybody else being involved with that job at the time because Urban, I mean, he had the health issues and, and really it kind of took on a life of its own the week of the Maryland game on the Sunday after the Maryland game. Pete DeMell came out with his column after the television had captured Urban on the sideline, doubled over and uh, in obvious pain and um, that something was wrong. And um, Pete DeMell in a lot of ways was the 
the Yahoo Sports and previously the New York Times Ohio State beat writer, you know, because of a relationship with Urban Meyer in some respect, a great respect there. And uh, my guess is they'll probably bump him up to covering uh, the, uh, what are they in, the uh, AFC, NFC South. I, I don't even care about the NFL to the point. I don't even know if Jacksonville's in the AFC or the NFC. I certainly don't care about Jacksonville to the point of knowing if they're in the AFC or the NFC. Somebody, I think they're, they they got to be in the AFC because Carolina came in at the same time, and I know Carolina's in the NFC. So um, – I think they're in the AFC South. So, at any rate, maybe uh, Pete Pete will have his run with the AFC South now. But, at any rate, um, that was very abrupt. And you didn't even get the sense. I mean, it came up, what, after the Michigan game and before the Big Ten Championship, I think, like on December the 1st or 2nd, before the Big Ten Championship, or was it after the Big Ten Championship game? It seemed to me that I think it was the right after the Michigan game, maybe that he made the announcement and and there was no intervening period. I mean, it was, they announced he was leaving and Ryan day was taking over. So there was no speculation. I mean, there was always the Campbell idea, you know, even then, you know, is that guy going to be the next guy if, and when urban would ever leave. But uh, I don't know that anybody on the staff was really seen or viewed as that era apparent. Uh, they did name, uh, day as the uh, acting head coach for those three games early in the season when Urban served that suspension. But, um, you know, I don't think even Gene Smith at that point would have envisioned that Ryan Day was going to be the long-term uh, answer uh, to take over. But from a continuity standpoint, it has been fabulous. Obviously, they've lost two games, both in the playoff and have continued to recruit at such an extremely high level. And, you know, the world is kind of his oyster right now. There's there's nobody coming in the Big Ten to kind of threaten him. Nobody recruiting at the same level as Ohio State. I'm getting ready to work on a a Big Ten spring preview. In in the back of my mind, it's kind of like just change the names and the faces from last year to this year and say basically the same thing. It's like it's the big one and the little 13. I mean, it's – is kind of the thought. So until otherwise uh, uh, addressed, I think uh, we think this guy's doing a bang up job. So uh, until somebody can prove otherwise, but uh, you know, they've had a couple games, Northwestern game in particular, uh, the last two big 10 championship games with him as the coach, they didn't play very well, but they ended up winning both of them. Uh, typically they've blown most of the teams they've played out. Uh, they had huge lead over Indiana and blew it practically, nearly nearly got tied there toward the end. And, of course, Alabama was just kind of a uh, avalanche. Um, uh, Clemson was sort of an act of God, I would say, just kind of the way that all, you know, they won that game, I think, and anybody who watched it, they just didn't end up the game with more points than Clemson. Um, the Alabama game, you know, you're missing so many guys and guys get yep. hurt and uh, – you had kind of a once in a 25 year period offensive line quarterback, wide receiver and running back all at one school that were just nothing short of amazing for Alabama. So nobody could do much with them all year. So they were the best team in the country, no doubt. So, um, but yeah, I think uh, it's been, they've hit a home run with it. Whatever Gene Smith and urban Meyer saw in Ryan day, he was the real genuine article. And so far, so good. I mean, the only way that this uh, could change is if they stop recruiting five-star players or if there's complacency or if there's off-the-field problems, violations, uh, crime, rule-breaking, something of that nature that, you know, puts some key players on the shelf. But there's no indication anything like that's happening at Ohio State. You know, I remember after the the 2018 Michigan game, just – I caught Urban Meyer and Shelly Meyer sharing a hug, and it was very different than just your typical post-Michigan hug. And it it looked like it was them both acknowledging that this was the last time that he this was his last Michigan game, just uh, the emotion involved with it. And so, uh, you know, I, I think he knew well before then that Ryan Day was the right guy. But in terms of 
if it wasn't Ryan Day, who's it going to be? It would have been Urban Meyer because he would have kept coaching. He would he wasn't going to hand it over. Like the reason 2018 was a good year to end with was because Ryan Day was there. And if Ryan Day wasn't there, he would have been there in 2019. Heck, if they would have lost that Michigan game, he may, he may have stuck around as well for 2019. So if it wasn't Ryan Day, it would have been Urban Meyer. How long would it have been Urban Meyer? You know, that's that's another that's another story. And so I, I think, um, you know, I, as Steve said, and as I told you before, like we both mentioned Matt Campbell. He's like everybody just waits for Matt Campbell to take Ohio State or Michigan or Notre Dame, except those, none of those three jobs are open or have been offered to him or uh, or maybe Mich- or maybe Michigan was offered to him and he said no. And that's why Jim Harbaugh is still there. But yeah, I think. I think it's a short conversation, really. It's the reason it was Ryan Day is because it was Ryan Day. And if it wasn't, if Ryan Day wasn't there, it would have been Urban Meyer. Benet, again, thank you so much for the super chat. Remind everyone that uh, this show is brought to you by your individual contributions. And if you have a link, uh, a contact to a potential sponsor, hit me up at Mark Riders TV at Gmail. David Greenshield, gentlemen. Your opinion on the way the national media uh, handled the LSU situation that's currently still going on, but Les Miles, of course, um, the main culprit there, compared to Zach Smith and Tattoogate? Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if you compare the coverage of all these different things. It kind of the, a lot of it's the timing of when some of these things come out. Uh, the off season or, or when it may be. Um, obviously, you're talking about Les Miles, who's kind of been out of the picture. He's been in the witness protection program as the head coach at Kansas uh, for the last two or three years. And, um, you know, uh, Lewis Papp is asking where we're supposed to push the, the Super Chat to. What are the directions on how to use the Super Chat, uh, Mark? Can you Can you yeah. run that real quick? Yeah, so in the Super Chat, if you go to the bottom of the feed, so where you're typing in your questions and comments in the live chat, there should be a dollar sign at the bottom of that scroll. Okay. Just click on that dollar sign, and then you fill it out uh, at whatever question or comment you make in amount. There's your your ask a question and put in a large dollar amount, and we'll be happy. (laughs) Um. Getting back on what what were we discussing again? I'm sorry. I had the something LSU, I was going to say. The national, My media, the national media's treatment of the LS, the current LSU situation versus some of the Ohio State scandals in the last 10 years. Yeah, and, and here's Miles. I mean, he's been out of the spotlight at Kansas. He's really not a, a big name anymore. I mean, he was, I mean, at LSU, but in, in the things he was accused of doing were were not good things, certainly. Um, I feel bad for any victims, uh, alleged, you know, uh, accused otherwise, you know, whatever he's come up with, whoever accused him of things, I I feel bad for those people. Um, but I, I don't know. I think Ohio state's kind of on its own stratosphere when things happen, uh, the national media are going to blow those things out of proportion and, uh, you know, are going to cover them to a higher degree than if they happen at LSU or, or somewhere else. I mean, you know, maybe Alabama would be an example or I don't know, but uh, some of it probably has to do with the fact that, you know, uh, interest, you know, in Ohio state football is probably, you know, from a national standpoint, probably three or four times higher than it is in LSU football. But, you know, down there, you know, whatever, it is what it is. I mean, it's big in Louisiana, but you know, how many people live in Louisiana? About five million, six million. I'm going to hear so, about this, Steve. I can, I can just tell now already. That's fine. That's fine. I, I don't mean to diminish. I mean, LSU has got a great following, but you know, do they have as many people following them as Ohio State? I don't think so. So, I mean, they they're a great SEC program, no question. Uh, but I just wonder if that's some of the disparity that it doesn't involve Ohio State. Um, I think Ralph Russo or somebody tweeted out, or no, it was a guy named Bozich from the Louisville television station. When he saw that job game open, he said, 
does anybody want a really bad job? You know, the Kansas job. So um, I immediately said, Tom Herman, uh, somebody tweeted out that they won 20 games in two years with uh, Bear Mangino. And since the day he left, they've won 26, something like eight, nine years since he's been there. They've won a total of 26. So maybe bring back Bear Mangino and all his uh, warts and uh, maybe he'll get them back where they need to be. So three or four times higher nationally. Jesus, Steve, that's not accurate. What's the population of Louisiana? Does anybody know the population of the state's population? I'm going to give it a guess. Where's Ohio? Like 12 million? 13. 12, 13. 13. I'm going to say Louisiana is six. Six and a half. Yeah, I was going to say six and a half, six. I mean, everybody yeah. left New Orleans, right? After Hurricane Katrina, everybody left. I mean, I don't know. It's at least double, for God's sake. Let's don't even, you know, joke. But, but the, well, and the thing is, Ohio State is more of a national brand than LSU, which creates a, a much more um, interest. And, and the thing is, like, Les Miles is a bigger name than Zach Smith, but and should should have created more buzz. But Ohio State is Ohio State, and it's been that way forever. And you even look at the stuff that came out this past week with Rush Probst accusing Georgia and Alabama of those things, and if and naming names of the 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 bag men and the coaches, and if he had named the names of those people at Ohio State, I'm going to guess about four or five different networks would have been camped out in Columbus or on their way or I've already gotten here because I remember in the past when ESPN would be in Columbus for weeks at a time and have producers like asking people, have you heard anything? Do you know anything? Have you spoken with anybody? Trying to speak with people. And that's because it was Ohio State. And, and so you, it's just two different – worlds where um, and then you also have does you know with with CBS and ESPN being such uh, financial partners with the SEC there's not going to be a lot of well let's let's get to the bottom of this no you don't want to get to the bottom of that you want to keep everything just as it is uh, but also you know the uh, you know, we talked about this on my Buc on Buckeye weekly podcast where tattoo gate would be almost I wonder if it would be kind of nothing if it happened now, other than the fact that it is still Ohio State, because you had the, the tattoo gate, and then then you had some other stuff, and you had like Nevin, Nevin Nevin Shapiro after that. But in between there, there was the Jerry Sandusky thing, which kind of reminded people of okay, this is this is actually what serious college issues are, and this is what the important issues are, and so people became a little bit more um, you know forgiving of any NCA infractions. But this is beyond NCA infractions. This is like human uh, interpersonal contact and in infractions where, eh, you know, what's done is done. He's no longer there. No need to do any digging. You, you know, you might not like what you find, but I'll be interested to see if local media continues to cover it, continues to press, because there can be a lot of pushback when you do that, especially at a big state school. And then always the, the – uh, it's not always worth the, the rate of return for a lot of places to try to create or find those kinds of issues. We have uh, all sorts of people in the live chat, including myself, before I checked out their numbers, uh, scurrying to figure out and find the population of the state of Louisiana, officially right here, 2019, 4.65 million, Steve. So even less than we thought. Yeah, Ohio's three times as many people. Uh, viewership, you know, of a ra random Ohio State game is going to be pretty high. A random LSU game, probably good. Obviously, when they're playing Alabama or whoever, and it's two versus three, then it's a big deal. But, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not backing on LSU. Just the question was asked, why didn't they cover it to the same degree? And uh, that's that's all I was ever – uh, saying so, I think people make a good point on here on the chat that the ESPN's in bed with the SEC. So, I mean, it may run in the scroll, the scroll across the bottom, but they're not going to spend time, you know, more than a few seconds on Sports Center talking about it. I got to say, for one, uh, the tattoo gate, uh, especially as the years go by, drives me nuts more and more and more and more because 
the Zach Smith situation, I, I can see both arguments in regards of the defense of Urban Meyer and the criticism of Urban Meyer. And uh, it's, it's a pretty complicated situation involving relationships and so forth. You talk about what's going on at LSU and what Les Miles carried with him from Oklahoma State to LSU. You have your head coaches who may turn a deaf ear or a blind eye to a situation who really would like the, the student athletes to conduct themselves well, but still winning's more important. So I'm just going to, you know, not pay attention. Les Miles like perpetuated, he like created a culture, it seems, where he encouraged this kind of behavior. And you're talking about abuses against people and against women versus selling some memorabilia that you earned on a football fee. I just, if the NCAA can come out with violations that are anywhere close to the same level, and they already have, um, involving those kind of situations where people's lives are being harmed seriously versus <laughs> dealing with trinkets and tattoos is crazy seem, to me. I seem to recall Les Miles once allowed his team to vote on whether to suspend a player or not, and they, they decided not to suspend a player. So, a shocker. <laughs> What a surprise, as our friend Tim, Tim May would say, as he quotes the late, great Hayden Fry about some uh, Big Ten indignity extended to the Hawkeyes. What a surprise. It's a close vote, I'm sure. Oh, but yeah. Hey, thank you so much for another Super Chat coming in here. We so much appreciate that. Vinay, a huge Buckeyes fan. Thoughts on the development of Cameron Babb this offseason, Tony. I've heard from Jaden Ballard that the drills are insane for any average individual. Yeah, I know media is supposed to be impartial, but if there's one guy you root for on this Ohio State roster, it's Cameron Babb, who I think was injured toward ACL maybe in high school and then like twice at OSU so far. And I believe this is his fourth year and has finally got to play last year, didn't get any catches. And so that's like the next big step is to for him to start getting the ball. But I, his mom was uh, you know, family's very instrumental in, in organizing parents and getting them organized to protest last year. And so, but this is a guy who is um, you know could have quit at this point and hasn't, and is one of I believe nine top 100 receivers currently on Ohio State's roster. And again, Chris Olave is not one of those, so he's in a very deep room and yet continues to want to play at Ohio State and continues to work and was healthy last year and is, you know, if you go back and look at his uh, high school highlights, he was definitely a top 100 player and was a good size, fast, could cut, could do a bunch of different things for you, and now has become a, one of the leaders of the receiving group. And, and you just – you would like to see all of that hard work and all of the uh, – just everything he's gone through – be rewarded with some playing time. And 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 then you look at who's in front of him, and it's just five-star after five-star. And so this this spring, he'll have an opportunity to you know, get into that too deep. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for everybody. Every, and it's even if you're in the too deep, it's going to be tough to play. Because, Steve, how, how much do you want to take Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson off the field? Not much. Yeah, those guys are going to continue to play about 70% of the snaps, and that creates an issue for Jackson Smith, the Digba, Jamison Williams, and everybody else. So I am uh, of a mind that uh, you're going to have to be really good and on top of your game to have a, a, an opportunity to play. I think what will help is obviously they're going to play um, – some lesser opponents this year. Um, I don't have the schedule committed to memory. I know they play Minnesota and Oregon, I think the first two games. And then I think there might be an Akron in there or something. And then I don't know what – I don't forget who the other team is. Maybe Tulsa? I don't know. Does that sound right? Yep. I so, so, yeah, and again, Tulsa had a pretty good team last year. So that may not be the walkover that you think it might be. But um, they are going to play – you know, a few few of those extra games where hopefully some of those younger guys will get a chance to play and show what they can do. And I think it also helps that um, 
you know, the guys who were freshmen this past year, like uh, Julian Fleming and Smith the Jigba, aren't going to get charged a year of eligibility. I mean, they've still got four years left if they want it. Um, so, you know, again, I know those guys probably have delusions of going three and out or four and out or whatever, but, um, you know, the option is there for them to, to stick around. The, 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 basically, their clock's not ticking really yet. So uh, I think the best players are going to play. And I think that uh, they have to play because you have young quarterbacks and the young quarterbacks need to rely on reliable receivers to make plays for them. And that is just so paramount to the confidence of the young quarterbacks. So they can't have a clown show out there, you know, learning on the job, dropping balls and, and not making plays. So uh, they need they need one and one A out there getting it done for them. So. When the, when the game is still hasn't been decided, which I would say anything less than 23 points, uh, assume that uh, Wilson and Olave are going to get 70 to 80% of the reps. We talk Ohio State football here every week with uh, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop there in the middle, Steve Hellwagon, 247 Sports Bucknuts, typically Kevin Noon. We hope he's doing well. Everything's good. Basketball's on uh, everybody's minds. Uh, the Buckeyes will play the winner of Minnesota and Northwestern. They play tonight at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Minnesota has lost seven in a row. Northwestern's won three in a row, including a win over Minnesota, which means Minnesota will probably win tonight, given the way that things usually happen in college basketball. But anything can happen. And both these teams have already beaten Ohio State during the course of the year. So – uh, Ohio State doesn't have it easy, even though they're playing two teams with losing records or the winner will still have a losing record. And um, then if they win, they get to play Purdue, a team that beat them twice during the regular season. So you're wondering, how does Ohio State have such a great seed if uh, they lost all these games to these other teams? But they did actually beat them pretty good teams along the way until they fell apart at the end of the season. So um, can they put it back together uh, starting tomorrow at 2 p.m. on Big Ten Network? Uh, inquiring minds are, are wanting to know, so we'll see. I think it sets up pretty good for them as long as uh, – because if they lose to Purdue three times in, in this, this year, that would be um, that'd be pretty surprising. Uh, but I, I do think they need Michigan State to beat Michigan in order to play on Sunday. So we'll see. Yeah, I don't I don't envision any way they would get past Michigan. And in Michigan with Eli Brooks, their guard, he went down in the game on Sunday. Phil Martelli, their assistant coach, called him the team MVP. So that's something to watch with Michigan, whether or not Brooks kind of a glue guy. You know, people don't think about him a lot with Wagner and uh, Livers and the big kid Hunter Dickinson, but Brooks is a pretty good player. If he's – if he can go or can't go, may decide how long Michigan makes it. But I'm just doing my picks right now, and uh, I do think Ohio State win two games in this tournament, somehow finds a way to beat uh, Purdue and gets up against Michigan. But having to play a third game in three days, uh, you know, Ohio State's a little creaky as well with Young and uh, Suing and Jallo and Walker and, you know, some of these guys need a Walker to get around sometimes, it seems. Like so, I think that uh, that third game is going to be their Waterloo, and uh, that'll be the one that sends them uh, back. And then they'll wait on Sunday their placement for the NCAA. And then one last thing on on basketball, Mark. Before we move on, Chris Holtman did say today Justin Suing hasn't practiced this week, had a procedure done, and is getting back today. So that's just one other guy that has um, had some issues and uh, health wise. We know Kyle Young is always day to day. And so that's just uh, another thing to, to worry about. I am, I, I have my, uh, my hotel is for two nights. I'm checking out on Saturday. And I think that's probably uh, as, as long as Ohio state will be in the, in the, in the postseason. Unless we'll have, the, we'll have the ba bags packed and in the car. And when they, if, if, and when they lose, then we'll head uh, east on 70. If they were somehow to win, we'll grab our phone. We'll get on hotels.com <laughs> exactly. and we will dial up a $80 room downtown because all the fans of whatever team has lost will be going out of town and there will be suddenly rooms available. It's my history with the big 10 tournament is you don't need to book for an entire weekend or stay at the $220 a night media hotel because 
rooms will come available as teams lose. Uh, I'm not so sure about rooms for the following week with the NCAA tournament, with them allowing fans at the six different venues and also having 68 teams at least to start the week uh, in Indianapolis. I think you're going to be stuck on the outer belt for that one because I think everything's going to be booked up solid. But uh, at least for this one, I, I think you can, uh, you can find a place to stay. And, you know, my famous story is back 11 years ago in 2010, Evan Turner hit that shot to beat Michigan and uh, we had not checked into our room yet and all of our stuff was in the car and they were losing to Michigan. I'm thinking we're not even going to go to the hotel. We're just going to cancel now, get in the car, go back home. And he hit the shot. We were stuck there two more days and they won the tournament. So you never know. It's tournament Mm -hmm. basketball. Crazy stuff happens. I gave up on Notre Dame yesterday and then I looked up and saw they hit a buzzer beater at the end and won. So you know, what What can you do? And I'm sure there's more frivolity going on right now. Uh, one last thing on that, that Michigan game. I was – that was the same day as Ohio State's pro day. So I was at the WAC watching that, uh, standing next to Bo Schembechler's son, Shemi. And and so uh, we got to we got to watch that together. He was talking all kinds of crap throughout <laughs> the entire game. Thought it was all but over. And then uh, Evan Turner hits that shot. And he just, you know, turns and walks away and it was getting uh, quite a bit of grief. So good times. I watched that game at a hotel bar in San Diego. I was having <laughs> myself a good time in San Diego that week. I didn't have a care in the world. Were you covering the Mountain West tournament in San Diego? I was not. I was vacationing and having a good time. Spring break. Yes. Were you working for the four letter at that point or where were you working? Oh, I was, I was working for them. No, I was, I was taking the week off though. I was, I hope you boys came prepared to give your Oregon prediction. You you should have known to prepare for that. Pat Brown is demanding score prediction week two, Oregon. Come on, Pat. Give us Ohio state 38, Oregon 24. Trust you enjoyed it. There it is. That's exactly the score I was going to give. I mean, that, that's that's the like, I think that's about right what now. the Miami – I always kind of default to whatever that Miami game was back in 2010. 37-24. Yeah, that's just your vintage, bring in a name school, you know, middle of the road, probably ranked anywhere from 10th to 20th, and and that's your final score. Ohio State by two touchdowns and a relatively high-scoring game, mm-hmm. entertaining game. You know, each team makes some plays, and it's a fun game, and – Yet the you know Ohio State grinds it out with the running game in the second half. Plays great defense, and that's that. Talking Ohio State football with these two: Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop, Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts. I mean, non-conference games at home in the last twenty years. I mean, that's a great twenty-year period of Ohio State football. They would have lost uh, to Oklahoma. Virginia Tech uh, with Urban Meyer, and that might have been it. And USC. then with – well, USC was with uh, – Jim Trestle was still the coach oh, in the late 2000s. Okay. And other than that, those may be the only three in the last 20 years, unless I'm missing one somewhere. Texas, Texas with Trestle, yeah. So there's four. Um, that may be it. So they have a pretty good track record in those – uh, marquee non-conference games at home, uh, typically. So, you know. And next year, what is it? They're going to have Notre Dame at Ohio State next year. Is that right? Eight home games for uh, the Buckeyes next year. It's kind of – I think the only way they could get Notre Dame to work out was to do the home game next year and then at South Bend the following year. And it doesn't work out for Ohio State because it gives them eight one year and six the next. But – you know, as long as you have the eight the first year, you can put that money in the bank and put it on the following year's tab when you only have six, I guess. But, uh, you know, you got to make those ends meet. Um, as uh, Gene Smith said in our call a little while ago, the pandemic is probably going to leave them about 50 to $60 million short for this one uh, school year because they didn't have those six, seven home games, which is probably about all they're missing out on, really. Because, you know, basketball, you know, they make a little bit of money off hosting basketball, I guess. But uh, everything else is certainly a wash. So uh, they got to come up with $60 bucks. 
Fans are excited about uh, Trevion Henderson and Evan Pryor. Uh, Master Teague's a good back. Uh, Marcus Crowley, we haven't seen much from. Mayon Williams contributed last year. But do we believe, and it's tough to put this much on two guys that have never carried a football at this level, but do we expect those guys to be just at a different level once they hit their stride? I Go ahead, Tone. I um, I will not be surprised if Trevion Henderson is starting by the end of the year. I don't expect it because there are so many guys in front of him, but they are both different than pretty much anything Ohio State has. I've said it before here. I think uh, Evan Pryor reminds me of uh, Travis Etienne. That's that's a kind of back that he reminds me. Of. I can also catch catch the ball. Travion Henderson is. Some some like to say he reminds them of Reggie Bush, and uh, I wouldn't you know necessarily disagree with that. And Ohio State just doesn't have guys like them, but I, th- I think the guys they they do have are still pretty good. I think there's a there's there's a place for Master Teague. Is if he is the starting running back, is is he limiting Ohio State? I think I think that there's an argument there because we he can do so much, and but he has limitations. Now he was coming back from an Achilles injury last year and. He'll be better this year than he was last year, and they need a more agile guy, and that he should be that or should be more agile than he was. So there's that. Um, Mayan Williams I really, really like, but it's amazing how much people like him after just 10 carries. I think he had 10 carries for 60 yards last year. That's a very small sample size. We know he, he made some nice moves, and he did this and he did that. We have no idea if he can hit the home run. And, and so I think that's a question mark. And if you can't, eventually you fall out of favor with everybody. Kind of like J.K. Dobbins did in 2018 when people stopped believing he was the 2017 J.K. Dobbins. And then he showed them in 2019 that, yeah, I am still pretty good. So, uh, tr- But Henderson and Pryor are both guys that can hit the home runs. And they have said that they could see um, using Pryor more in the passing game a little bit. And uh, it – it's going to be really hard for them to keep Henderson off of the field, which means it's going to be difficult for guys like, I don't even think you mentioned steel chambers. Like they've got five, six guys that can play, uh, but not five or six guys who are going to play. And I, I think you have to give snaps to Henderson. I don't know that you necessarily need to give them to prior unless he earns them, but you've got to, these guys are playmakers supreme. And so one of them, will find a way to the field, I think, in some capacity. Like, you know, four, five, six hundred yards rushing for Trey Leon Henderson, I don't think is is that outrageous. I think it's good that they've restocked the position. I think they've got a lot of options, and I don't think they're going to hesitate to use them. I think that uh, Teague is going to be the guy to open the season if he's healthy and everything else is equal. I think he's going to get the first shot at it, but that's not – a blank check to not be a difference maker, you know, all season long. I, they're not going to wait around. They're going to go to the hot hand, I think. And if Henderson can get in there and make some early inroads and, and do some things, then he's going to play. Again, they, they're not looking for guys that are gamers, although, you know, that kind of runs counterintuitive. You, everybody, you want everybody to be a, quote, gamer. But they need guys who will put the work in and earn the coach's trust in practice and master the position. You know, that's what they're looking for. And um, sometimes young guys come in and don't necessarily understand that. They think, and particularly guys that didn't get to play last year. I mean, not, not getting to play as high school seniors for some of these guys could work to their detriment a little bit. Um, but same time, they should be fresh, and, and perhaps it doesn't. So – I don't know. I'm I'm kind of torn on the whole thing. Uh, again, I'm not going to get wrapped up in the name of the player. I just need to see the production. And uh, I have no doubt that if somebody's an impediment to what they need to do offensively, they're going to move that player out of there and get somebody in there who can do it. So uh, I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, they, they've shown that that they're going to play the best players. They, they, you know, this idea of, of, of somebody, you know, getting a spot by default is just not in Ryan Day's makeup. I mean, they, they're playing the, the best guy. There's, there's no way they're playing somebody by default. 
and you saw Trey Sermon eventually take that job. And, you know, he, he wasn't playing that well to start the season and midway through the season. And then eventually it, it was his. And yeah, Master T got dinged a little bit, but I don't think, I, I don't think if healthy Master Teague was going to be getting 20 carries the day, the, the week after Trey Sermon sets the school record with 331 odd yards rushing. So if you could produce, they'll give you the ball. And, and it, there's going to be a lot of guys. And I saw somebody say, notice they aren't mentioning Steel Chambers. And that's why I, I keep thinking, you know, it, he may have to move back to linebacker and, and uh, or not back to, but just a new position at linebacker because they're just there's just a lot of guys at running back right now and, and Henderson and Pryor add two more into the mix. And Marcus Crowley, I still think, you know, heading into last year, I kept saying he may be the most talented of the bunch, but we just haven't been able to, you know, he, he looked really good as a freshman until he got injured in uh, late no early November against Maryland and then just finally got back the last week of the season against Alabama. So we have no idea, like, what he looks like at this point, expect him to be better than he was at the end of last year. But he's a guy that we shouldn't forget about as well. He was like the player of the year in the state of Florida, which I don't know, uh, you know, it, it's it's a pretty decent high school football state. So when you were the player of the year in that state, that says something to me. Has Buckeye Nation noticed uh, the work that Alex Grinch is doing at Oklahoma? So here's a guy that went to Washington State with a bunch of two-star talent, like two-star Three stars were at the top end of the defense and a defense that was giving up 50 points a game. Washington State, Mike Leach is throwing the ball. They're they're winning and losing games in the 50s. Alex Grinch shows up. They suddenly churn out. Now they're playing Pac-12 competition, but still they're rising in the rankings to top 25 in the nation. Has his stint at Ohio State, jettisoned to Oklahoma. He leaves. He goes to Oklahoma. Their defenses have been ranked between 80th and 110th in the country during this run to playoff appearances and Big 12 championships. Their S&P Plus last year was 15th. All the major metrics, third down, red zone, all those, they're in the top 20 or 25 with Alex Grinch running the defense. He was at Ohio State. He didn't have full run of the defense, but did they let one slip away there? Um. I, yeah, Grinch was – I don't know that he ever got um, – I don't, I don't think him and Greg Schiano ever really meshed, and and I wonder how much him and Ryan Day even meshed because I don't know exactly what the story was, but if like would Day have kept him around? I don't know. Um, I know he uh, gets some grief from Ohio State fans and for uh, – being viewed as this kind of wizard, and there was no magic when he was at Ohio State. The secondary, as the as the, the safeties coach, the secondary was a mess when he was there, and so uh, he gets some blame for that. He did not recruit well, and has has never recruited well. I don't know what he's doing in Oklahoma. I believe, like in his career, he's landed maybe like two or three three star kids, and uh, so th there's that issue as well. But if you this is the last thing holding Oklahoma back. I won't be surprised to see them in the playoffs this year. You know, your, your quarterback is more experienced. They always have skill. It's the defense that holds them back. And if – I guess if you can defend in the Big 12, that's something. But then once you get into the playoffs, what do you have up front? And that's going to be that, – that will always be the question for the Big 12 and the Pac-12 and even the ACC at times is, is what do you – and Notre Dame especially, what do you have up front? And can you handle the SEC and Ohio State when when that happens? And I, you know, that's that's for me is going to be the question with Oklahoma. But again, you have to have an awesome offense to win a national title. That shouldn't be an issue for them. Yeah, I agree. I think it was a case where uh, Ryan Day was on the staff, uh, obviously as assistant with Alex Grinch and Greg Schiano, and probably saw some things he did not like. Is kind of how it's kind of been put to me behind the scenes and uh, also had Jeff Halfley kind of, you know, as his thought, as his defensive guru and was bringing in Greg Madison as well. So uh, to my way of thinking, I just think that um, there wasn't a spot for Grinch on a staff led by Ryan Day, I think. And uh, he pretty quickly moved on, I think, as that kind of all played out. So, 
um, you know, good for him. I, I don't think he's a bad guy or anything. I just think that it was that they were all kind of caught in a, in a tough spot that year, uh, not having the personnel that they'd had there at previous years. And, uh, you know, Nick Bosa uh, going down early in that 2018 season kind of put a big crimp on it. Of course, they, you know, they, they, uh, what was it? Was that the Purdue year? I guess um, that was uh, a, a complete embarrassment and humiliation for the defense uh, against a really bad Purdue team. So I don't know, just, uh, just, just the way it worked out, you know, guys come and go. It's a transient uh, thing. I mean, I have seen dozens and dozens of assistant coaches come and go over the years. The good thing is, at least in the last 15 or 20 years with uh, Meyer and, and Trestle and now Day, is there's been pretty good stability. And I think that's very important in terms of recruiting and building a program and having people that people can count on. And uh, it's not a transient place. Typically, it's been a place where you can put down roots and stay a while if you do a good job recruiting and developing your players and if the, the whole thing kind of comes together. So um, that's kind of been my experience at least this last 20 years. Ohio State Buckeyes Live. We do this every week, typically Wednesday at 2 o'clock Eastern time. So lock it in there. But we have to switch from time to time. That uh Lock it in. Best for you to what's that? You lock it in. You lock it in. Lock yes. it in. Well, you guys determine when we go live. These guys we should be uh, good next week because they don't start the tournament till Friday, and we don't even know if we're going to get to go to the tournament. So it's kind of oh, up Thursday in the air. games or Ohio State. Thursday is the first four, and then the the opening round will be Friday. Yeah, Friday, Saturday will be the opening round, and Sunday, Monday will be the second round. Yeah, it's that's different new this year. year, right? This year, different. I don't okay. think that's a permanent change. I think that's just because of COVID and the bubble. Gives people an extra day to get to Indianapolis to bubble eyes. All right. Okay. Man, breaking from the Thursday, Friday tradition of the opener noon on Thursday. Wow. Well, you may get to watch Duke play in the first I'm glad four. you let me know, Steve. I might have been turning on my first basketball you might get uh, to watch Duke and, Michigan years, State, Duke and Michigan State turned. play in the first four. That might be interesting. On uh, and My guess is they'll spread those games out. You may get like a two, four, six, eight, something like that for those so that you have a little taste of it on Thursday afternoon. Michigan State, weren't they top five preseason? Mm -hmm. Wow. I think they finished like ninth place in the Big Ten from what I hear. I think they killed – didn't they kill Kentucky or Kansas in the first game? And Rocket Watts played like an all-time All-American. And I'm thinking, who's going to beat this Michigan State team? And then everybody did. So, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> the funny thing happened. Yes. Yeah, funny thing happened. College basketball in November doesn't much matter typically later, months later. All right, good stuff from, of course, Tony Gerdman right there in the middle from Buckeye Scoop and Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts on 247 Sports. Again, it's uh, it's every week with these guys. So typically Wednesday at 2 o'clock Eastern, but that's why it's important for you to subscribe, hit the bell for the notifications. That way you know when we're going live and when we bring you Ohio State Buckeyes Live. Guys, it's always a pleasure. Always appreciate the time and the expertise. We will see yep. you later and enjoy the basketball. Oh, it's oh gonna be we great. will.